Today, we are looking at the story of the woman who anoints Jesus' feet with ointment and then wipes him with her hair. Who is she? Is she someone thanking him for forgiveness? Are we at Simon the leper's house, a Pharisee's house? Where are we and who is she? Let's find out. If you're new here, this is the Caffeinated Bible. Why? Because a decaf Bible just won't get you where you want to go. My name is David Paris, and the goal of this channel is to take what I've been teaching at seminaries for over the past 20 years and break open the walls of the classroom and bring it to you on YouTube. If you find these videos encouraging and informative, then hit the subscribe button down below and YouTube will notify you when I post new content. And a thumbs up is always nice as well. Thanks. This week's reading in the lectionary is from John chapter 12. Over 100 years ago, Martin Keeler wrote that the Gospels are narratives about Jesus' trial, death, and resurrection with extended introductions. We can clearly see that in our reading today. John's Gospel is 21 chapters long, but starting with John chapter 12, we enter into the final week of his life. 11 chapters on Jesus' life and ministry, and then 10 chapters on just one week. Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, arrest, trial, death, and then resurrection. This helps you see what John thought was important when he wrote his gospel, the week leading up to and including and after Easter. The story that we're looking at this week is the hinge story between these two sections in John's gospel. So where are we? We're in Bethany at the house of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And our story is found in John chapter 12, 1 through 8. And I'm reading from the New English Translation today. Then six days before Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom he had raised from the dead. So they prepared a dinner for Jesus there. Martha was serving and Lazarus was among those present at the table with him. Then Mary took three quarters of a pound of expensive aromatic oil from pure nard and anointed Jesus' feet. Then she wiped his feet with her hair. Now the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfumed oil. But Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples, the one who was going to betray him, said, Why wasn't this oil sold for 300 silver coins and the money given to the poor? Now Judas said this not because he was concerned about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money box, he used to steal what was put into it. So Jesus said, leave her alone. She has kept it for the day of my burial. For you will always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. In my classes, I always teach that if you're going to interpret any passage, you need to understand its context. And the context for this passage is found in John 11, 55 through 57. Those three verses serve the important role of transition from Jesus raising Mary and Martha's brother Lazarus from the grave to Jesus staying at their house in Bethany. But those verses tell us more than that. We're told that the feast of Passover was at hand. This will be the last Passover during Jesus' life. John also sets the mood for our story by telling us that some in the crowds in Jerusalem were asking, what do you think? that he won't come up to the feast? At the same time, word was out that if anyone knew about Jesus' whereabouts, they should report it to the chief priests and the Pharisees. This brings us to our passage with Jesus and his band of merry men staying with Mary and Martha. In John 12, 1, we are told that it is six days before Passover. This sets the immediate context for our passage. In John 11.55, we were told that the Passover was at hand. Now he has zoomed into a very specific day. Six days before Passover would place us on a Saturday. Bethany was a small village also outside Jerusalem. The town of Bethany was located about two miles or three kilometers east of Jerusalem. When Jerusalem was filled with pilgrims for these high holy days, Many may have stayed in homes in the small villages surrounding Jerusalem, like Bethany. Lazarus' presence in this story 
ties this story back to Jesus calling him out from the grave in John chapter 11. The recent story about Lazarus' death and resurrection also foreshadows Jesus' death and resurrection that's going to occur in chapters 18 through 21. Verse 2 zooms the story in even more. This is not just the Sabbath before Passover, but it is taking place during the evening when everyone has gathered for the evening meal. The Net Bible has a note regarding this phrase, those present at the table with him. A better translation that they offer here is that those reclining at the table with him. Now, I've covered the nature of triclinniums and eating arrangements that were used in the ancient world. I'm going to include a clip from a video I made on that right now. As you can see, when they were eating at a triclinium, they would be reclining on benches around a common table in the middle, heads in the center, feet on the outside. This is what allows Mary in the story to anoint Jesus' feet. She just had to walk around the outside of the triclinium benches to have access to his feet. Verse three, expensive aromatic oil from pure nard. Expensive would be sort of an understatement here. In verse five, Judas is going to put a price on this ointment. 300 silver coins or denarii. Now, denarius was basically a normal day's wage for a normal day's work. The value that Judas places on this anointment would make it about a year's worth of wages. In today's money, let's say you made $50,000 a year, that would be $50,000 worth of ointment that she has brought to this table. Now, this was probably a family treasure that she is bringing out, something that was used on special occasions, perhaps for weddings or the burial of a family member. This little side reference to the amount of the ointment that she had and its cost tells us a lot about Mary and her family. We often assume that Mary, Martha, and Lazarus were a poor family. But look at the clues that we have within the text here. A. Mary and Martha are able to host a meal for Jesus and his band of disciples. This means that they had money to host a meal like this and a house large enough to accommodate at least 13 guests. John also tells us that they were reclining at this meal. This verb is used in conjunction when someone ate at a triclinium. Poor houses did not have rooms dedicated for eating in with features like a triclinium. They most likely ate seated on rugs on the floor. Third, Mary brings out a flask of myrrh worth a year's worth of wages. Most peasants during that day lived hand to mouth. So to have possessions like this indicates that they had a fairly high social possession within their village. In verses 4 through 7, Judas's attitude is singled out. Why wasn't this oil sold for 300 silver coins and the money given to the poor? Compare that with Mark's story, where we're just told that the other people at the table grumbled about the waste when the woman anointed Jesus. Verse 7 presents us with two interpretive questions. The first question is, did she use all of this oil when she anointed Jesus? Because she had three quarters of a pound, or in today's equivalence, that would be about nine ounces worth of this ointment. John doesn't tell us. He's rather ambiguous. He just tells us that she used it to anoint his feet. In fact, in verse 7, when Jesus rebukes Judas, he says, She has kept it for the day of my burial. The way the NET translates this sentence is rather guarded. It could refer to her anointing Jesus just now, but possibly also when his body is taken down from the cross. The English Standard Version puts the emphasis on Jesus' death and burial. Leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. The second question involves how we should interpret how Jesus responds to her actions. First, Mary may have been doing something very nice to Jesus, maybe as a response for her raising her brother Lazarus from the dead. Jesus then layers a more profound significance on her actions. She's preparing me for my death or will use this to anoint me once I am dead. In other words, Jesus sees Mary's actions as having a deeper meaning than she may have intended. On the other hand, Mary may have had some insight or awareness of the consequences of Jesus going up to Jerusalem during the Passover. 
Edwin Hoskins writes, Mary consciously recognized the necessity of Jesus' death and also recognizing that the hour had come, anticipated his burial by an act of intelligent devotion. Verse 7 also implies that Mary would use this ointment again when she helps prepare Jesus' body for burial after his death. Judas's statement then in verse 5 could be an overstatement. He wants Jesus to stop her from wasting this ointment on his feet so he could get his hand on that flask of ointment for his own personal gains. In the pulpit Bible commentary, H.R. Reynolds writes, and I've got to read it here so I get exact, that Jesus was thinking, after this very night, the opportunity to offer me affectionate attention or symbolic homage to give expression to feelings in accordance with just presentment as to my mission will be over forever and belong to the irrecoverable past. Now or never, she has done this thing. She will have everlasting remembrance thereby. Mary's actions are not in competition with meeting the needs of the poor. But like the gift of the Magi, these actions can never be repeated again. Her actions not only prepare Jesus for his entry into Jerusalem, but are preparatory of his death and burial, which will occur in less than a week. In this way, her act of devotion, love, and sacrifice calls to prepare our hearts for Good Friday and Easter as Lent draws to a close in two weeks. Mary's actions challenge my faith and my devotion and call me to a deeper commitment to Christ. I hope her story does the same for you. Until next week, peace. This is a lot like if you listen to three different passages. <clears throat> we could compare this to if you listen to three different pastors preaching on the same... We can compare this to the experience if you listen. We can compare this to the experience of if you listen to three different pastors. We can compare this to the experience of if you listen to. Mary's actions. Oh.